Hello, good to see you and many thanks for tuning in. My name is Felicity Ezewike. Let's talk elections. The large-scale community-based event that thrives on participation. In 2023, that's just days away, a number of African countries will be holding elections. Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, among others. Since the first transitions to democracy in the early 90s, the continent has held multiple elections and the process has evolved over the years. So also as the motivations and attitudes that African citizens bring to voting and other forms of participation in the democratic process. Experts say how people vote is a signal of their political and ideological preferences. But whether they vote at all tells us something about people's approval or disapproval of the institution of democracy itself as they experience it. Now, while the democratic experience varies, it remains for now, at least, the best form of governance and for its impact to be fully felt, there is need to improve on citizen participation in the electoral process. What have we been doing? What are we doing already? Is it working? We'll attempt in the course of the program to look at the factors that inhibit effective voter participation and how we can address them to reinvent the whole voter experience for our democratic growth. My guest is a self-described Democrat at heart and has shown this with his actions for the past 15 years. Glenn Mpani is the managing partner, Shikamo Political Advisory and Campaign Services. He is passionate about representative democracy with special interest in political campaigns, political party development, local government, parliaments and elections. He previously worked for the Public and Parliamentary Support Trust as well as the National Democratic Institute as a program officer focusing on elections in Southern Africa. He was before that the regional coordinator for the Africa Transitional Justice Network. Glenn has also worked with the Open Society Foundations Network, where he managed the democracy and governance program for the South Africa and Southern Africa Foundation. It is a pleasure to welcome you to One Slot, Glenn. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you so much for having me on your show, and uh, good evening to your listeners. Let's begin with the concept of democracy. What is your concept of democracy? and the people's role in fostering it? The concept of democracy is um, the process in which citizens who are informed play a critical role in electing those who represent themselves so that they can be able to effectively articulate their voice in public life. So in essence, because we can't have millions sitting around the room and determining their fate, the whole idea of a democracy is that it has to be participative. It has to allow citizens to be informed in the choices that they make so that at least whoever represents their views is able to articulate that effectively. So in basic sense, that's the whole essence of democracy. What about the people's role in fostering it? The citizens. So the people's role in fostering it, they have to participate. I think they have to participate, they have to hold their elected and appointed officials accountable. So the process of democracy does not only end with the electoral process, it continues even during the life of elected officials where they have to use um, methods such as petitioning, communing as a way of holding these officials accountable. And that in itself completes the whole circle of participative democracy. I mean, I needed to establish that from the onset because the whole point of this conversation is the voter to increase engagement. So when we talk about voter education, everybody talks about it. What does it really mean? It, does it have different interpretation or there is just one? One of the things that we need to be very, very clear about is that voting is a science. I think one of the missing link both in the actors who are the politicians or individuals who are aspiring for public office and political parties, the failure to understand that the process of one going to cast their vote is a science. And there are factors and there are variables that inform how one decides who to vote for. 
On the other side, there is also the important aspect of citizens themselves, how you communicate with them, what you are bringing up in terms of them participating is a factor. A critical angle that you need to understand is that voting is not rational. Voting is an emotional process. So if voting is an emotional process, the actors who are the politicians have to be able to understand how they can be able to reach out to an emotional voter. I, I mean, I, I need to clear that before we move on. You say it's an emotional process. Should it be? It shouldn't be an emotional, emotional, process, emotional process, but that's the reality. Citizens are attached to whoever they support. Data shows us the following, that when a voter is attached to their, a candidate to their political party, no matter how they badly perform, a voter rationalizes the bad performance of their candidate or their political party. This is why you're seeing high levels of uh, low voter participation. Because if a voter is disillusioned, the option is for them not to go out and vote. And what our political parties and most independent candidates are failing to understand is how do you get a voter who is disillusioned to come out and support and cross the floor and vote for your political party? That is where the greatest challenge is. And that is why we are now coming in to say we need to understand the voter more than we used to. Tactics that we used to use in the past, such as just coming up with posters and holding rallies, they don't work anymore. Okay, we'll try and explore that a little later, but let's um, explain some concepts. So whoever is following this conversation will um, understand where we're going. I personally, I tend to use it interchangeably. Voter education, voter participation, voter engagement. Are these terms synonymous or are they distinctions? You talked about um, voting being um, a science. Is it also, just explain for us, is there a distinction or these are just terms we use to reference the same thing? Right. There are a couple of steps that are very important. The first thing in an election is voter education. First of all, is getting someone to understand why it's important for them to register to vote. The second stage is educating the voter. When we are talking about educating the voter, is we are educating the voter in terms of who they are going to be voting for, why it's important for them to go out and vote, and how they can make a choice that benefits them. And here we've got a combination of ways in which this can be done. There are organizations that do that as civil society, political parties themselves, they do that. So there are two issues that happen here. One is an overload of information that is shared with a voter. In essence, a voter has so much information bombarded through all avenues. The critical question for one to ask themselves is, is that information playing a positive role in helping them decide and also encouraging them to vote? That's a critical issue that needs to be distinguished and to be understood. The next factor that is also very important in terms of the process of participation is we also need to understand that when a voter is informed, they know who the candidates are and they decide not to go and vote, it is also participation in an election. So in most elections, when we are assessing how citizens have participated in an election, we are so caught up in the numbers of those who turned out. But in realistic terms, not participating is also a signal. So in most in elections, we need to be able to understand the numbers and why citizens who voted five years ago have decided not to vote. Okay. There's something you tweeted that I, I need to reference now. I think it's instructive to this uh, conversation as we go. Uh, your words exactly. Uh, no one is immune from the decisions and choices of political parties. You ignore them to your own peril. Normalize joining and actively participating in political parties. 
Um, that's uh, the end of the quote. You posted this, I think, about three or four days ago. Um, my question is, is it necessary for citizens to join political parties to show commitment to the democratic process, or they can still be fully committed without being in any party? I've got very strong views. I believe that if you don't join a political party, you are limiting your level of participation in the democratic cycle. Let me give you an example. Political parties play two very important roles. One, they shape policy. Two, they identify candidates that are going to run in public office. You forfeit your right to complain about the quality of candidates if you don't participate in the role of primary elections of political parties selecting candidates. Number two, they determine policy. You might sit in the banking sector, you might sit in the mining sector. Those individuals who sit in political parties, they will shape the mining policy. They will shape the policy in terms of how goods are going to be traded. Because this is happening within a party. Once a party gets into office, it has a mandate to implement its policy and to identify leaders who are going to lead. But is so it possible, let, let, let me interject, is it possible really for everyone to, be, to belong to a political party or the other? Wouldn't that affect uh, the choices? You talked earlier about the emotional response. Um, uh, voting is an emotional, let me see if I get it now, it's an emotional process, right? So if you will commit to a political party, and maybe in the process the political party is not doing well, where does that leave the voter? So I wanted you to, you know, explain that a little more. You have a choice, Felicity. You have a choice. If party A is not fulfilling your aspirations, you join the other party. But all I'm basically trying to say is the power of a citizen who is ob observing from outside and complaining on Twitter, go writing op-eds, <laughs> and criticizing is no longer powerful because once political parties are now dealing with the decisions making, they are more inward looking, they are looking at their candidates, they are looking at their policies, and they frankly do not care about those who are outside. Remember, if you want to win an election, there are two sorts of citizens that help you to win an election. You win an election from your supporters and secondly, from mm -hmm. undecided. This is the, the base in which you get the people who are going to support you in an election. Non-voters alike. I'm trying to get that down because um, I'll need to probably reference it as we go. Um, yeah, it was important to establish that because sometimes we, <laughs> we don't think it's our responsibility to belong to any party. We just decide based on those who are there. So it, it's a clear distinction that we needed to make that we all need to be a part of the process. How would you describe the current level of voter engagement across Africa if compared to, say, 10 years ago? So the reality is the voter is now sophisticated. So we can never say the non-participation of a voter or voter engagement is simply because they don't know the importance. I think citizens have reached a point where they've realized that they go to vote when they trust the leadership and when they know that they're going to get results out of it. When they don't participate in an election, it's important for you to look at the landscape and understand what is happening. Ten years ago, if you look at many countries, uh, two or three decades ago, with the advent of democracy, there were high levels of participation. But what citizens have now realized is that there is a tendency of those elected into office not delivering and doing it for personal gain. So you'll find that during elections, citizens have also understood that this is now a transactional process. If they want to get something from candidates, that's when they get free T-shirts, free food, and they get patronage, and they don't go and vote. Yeah, that, that's quite unfortunate. What are some of the factors you've talked about? It, is a trend. it shouldn't be a transactional um, a business, should it? It should come, politicians should come from a place of wanting to serve and improve the lives of others, while people should come from a place of wanting to get the best possible candidates to help them fulfill their goals. Should it be transactional? I think we should address that quickly. The tragedy of elections in Africa 
is that those that are capable and those who have got the heart to deliver, they have taken a position of not participating in public life because either they say politics is dating, either they are not committed to the, the mobilizing processes that are involved in it, and they're not patient. So you find that the critical mass of quality candidates, who you, you know fully well that they can deliver, and most of them, they would remain in the private sector, go into academia, and they'll say, we don't want to be part of it. But unfortunately, they are governed by some of the most incompetent people on the continent. I've got one country that I will not mention, where you find that one of the capital cities with a budget of to close to a billion dollars, it's managed by councillors who, in essence, don't even have basic education. I disagree with people that representative politics doesn't need education. How do you determine a budget of a city when you're illiterate? It doesn't work. Okay. What, what, what would you say are, you've highlighted uh, basic education, what are some of the other factors that inhibit the level of voter engagement when it comes to elections? So the mode of communication, we have got the advent of data now in terms of mobile penetration, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp platforms. The challenge that we have that is now political parties assume that if I go on Twitter, if I go on Facebook, I'll reach out the, to the people. But you are forgetting that the infrastructure within a country determines the level in which people can be able to access. How many people can access these social media platforms? So in essence, it's very important when we are talking about citizen engagement to be able to first of all understand your community. Which, what type of a community do we have? What are the modes and means of communication? Who are their key influencers within either the traditional chief either it's a religious leader, then find ways of domesticating and localizing how you reach out to a voter. That is very important. What can happen in this village is not the same in the other village. But the laziness, sorry to use the word, the laziness of our candidates and political parties is coming up with a one-size-fits-all approach. And that is detrimental to improving the quality of democracy. Okay, that's a major one. Are there others? Because it, it can't just be the mode of, um, you know, engagement alone, the mode of communication. There must be other things that has uh, affected. I am, I, I, I am very, very biased towards methods that are quite localized. If a community meets in a church, if a community surrounds itself around the church, go there. If it needs door-to-door -door campaign, go there. I believe that you reach out voters in spaces that they are accustomed to. Our people come in when there's a wedding, when there is baby celebration, when there is a funeral. Use the channels that they are accustomed to to reach out to them. This whole idea of rallies and whistle stops, it becomes entertainment in a community. But the essence of it and thrust of it is not localized. That is key. Mode of communication, localizing it um, is important. Uh, can you explain for us, um, before we talk, start talking, um, expanding a bit more on the solutions, what is the connection between um, the integrity of um, the election process and voter participation? You can just explain that quickly. So you will never find an election management process that is neutral, that is fair and above board. You always find that election management bodies, they vary in terms of the quality of election which they conduct. But I have a view that I always have that if citizens participate effectively, no matter how badly managed an election is, a candidate can prevail under those circumstances. Voter participation can be able to prevail against rigging, to prevail against bad management of an election. All these vices, they prevail when citizens don't turn up. I guess we all are involved in the process. Is it cliche? Because you hear it say, oh, why should I vote? Does my vote count? Can you explain the validity of that cliche? 
a lot of persons don't seem to believe it, but is it valid that every single vote counts in the election process or not? It is very irresponsible for any citizen not to participate in an election. And it is also equally dangerous for a citizen just to stay away, not informed by what is happening. The reality of our lives is that politics shapes our destiny. So no matter if I stay at home and I don't make my voice count, decisions will be made on my behalf and they will determine my fate. So if you decide that you are not going to vote, find other means of participating and engaging because at the end of the day, decisions are going to be made on your behalf and they will affect you in terms of what you eat, the education that your kids go to, the type of um, uh, health services that they get, the how the economy is managed, everything is determined whether you have participated or not. So it's very irresponsible. Politics shape our destiny. To find solutions, an understanding of the issues are imperative. We've established that. He said, I'll say it again, politics shape our destiny in Africa. We'll take time after this break to look at what's being done to promote voter participation and ways we can further improve. Don't go away. New Central TV, Africa's number one storyteller, has come with the best of both worlds. With a combination of news app and live TV, we ensure that you keep track of the latest headlines, breaking news, and in-depth analysis from professional journalists from around the continent. Download the New Central TV app on Android and iOS and get started today. Don't forget to follow us on New Central's social media platforms. New Central, Africa first. Thank you for staying with us. We're still talking voter engagement and I still have Glenn Mpani uh, with us. We're looking at solutions now, but what are we currently doing that you know that is working in improving um, voter engagement? So let's start at looking at what is working. I think what is working now is we regularly hold elections. And I think uh, in doing so, at least that culture of people knowing that at some point we're going to be holding elections is important. But inversely, the danger of it is that when you regularly hold the election and the quality is not looked at effectively, it becomes a ceremonial process because people are not reaping any dividends out of it. So that is one issue that one needs to be able to deal with. Secondly, we are seeing a number of people coming up as independent candidates. We now have many coalitions across the continent that is providing options to citizens in terms of who to elect and who to vote for. That is also an advantage that is coming in. Thirdly, the presence of alternative sources of information. We no longer only have TV and radio now as options. People have other means in which they can be able to access information. So that in itself is a benefit in terms of voters being able to access information and not waiting for a candidate to come to them and explain to them who to vote for and why they should vote for that person. So those are the critical advantages that we are now having in this environment in terms of participative democracy. Uh, but, but that also comes with its own challenges, does it? Doesn't it? it? It does come with its own challenges. I think any measure that we, it comes with its, its own challenges. And I think the, and, and the, the other factor, sorry, that I didn't mention is that we now have a lot of investment in electoral politics. Even though it's coming up with this toxicity, the role of money in politics is a problem. Many people are now putting money into politics, but it's being done in a way that in terms violate the policies on campaign financing and all that. But it's a critical challenge. So in each and every aspect that I've mentioned, in terms of the, the rise of independent candidates, the reality is that we are now having, we have more people in institutions who are not accountable to an organized body. That's a problem on its own. The issue of information, we have the rise of disinformation and fake news that is coming up. So these are critical challenges that are coming up with new measures coming on board. 
I mean, alternative source of information, independent candidacy, uh, money investment, it has the plus and the negative side. But how can we amplify the positive, the improvement that it has brought to the electoral process? and then maybe diminish all the negative that comes with it. You, you said something uh, about the monetary part of it. People are investing, but in a way that doesn't break the rules. So isn't that a good thing? Isn't it something we should maybe highlight a little more? One thing that we need to understand about elections is that anything that you introduce, there is always a group of people who try to find ways of circumventing those issues. So it's a reality and effect of life that we have to deal with. So everything that we introduce, there is always a clique that would like to get around it. But that should not deter us from improving the process. It shouldn't stop us. So if we have got avenues of access to information that are there and are being abused with fake news, let's find mechanisms and ways of self-regulation in ensuring that there are ways of fact-checking. That is important. When we have got the issue of money and politics, let's find ways of regulating it. Yes, politicians will always find ways of using money in a toxic manner, but that should not deter us from doing what is right. I think that is important so that at least we improve the game. We allow those who have got less resources, but who are quality candidates for them to be able to participate. What, what, what would you say off the top of your head that you think maybe is a matter of fact thing we could be doing to uh, improve on the quality of voter education as it were now? There is a lot that we could be doing. And I think I would like to say this, whatever, very, this, this other point. Our organizations that are mandated to provide voter education are also now caught up in a mode where they just fundraise for voter education, but they are not thinking of innovative ways. They do the same thing every five years because this is also now an industry. They are making money out of it. They are living off it. And so there is less interrogation even from the funders on what else are you going to do in terms of not only getting people registered, but getting them to the polls. You find that we've got mechanisms in other countries where they say, go and register, we'll give you an award, you attend a concert, and there's no effort of getting those individuals to go to the polls. So the methods and mechanisms, some of them are now tired. They really need to evolve with the time. That's, that's fair. Let's talk gender. There are concerns that men still dominate political spheres in Africa and that women are less likely to vote. Is this still true today? It is very true. Politics is masculine in nature. The risks that come with participating in politics are very high. Politicians or politics is missed. most decisions and discussions happen at night. And it's very risky for a candidate to be able to participate in the evening if you're a woman. Secondly, fundraising is a masculine factor. Where do you get the money? Imagine a woman going to look for money from other men, the risks that come with it. Thirdly, politics in most instances is very violent. So the reality of it is that women find it very risky. Fourth, there is a pillar of women who find other women rising up is something that is abhorrible. And so in essence, they don't support them. So you find that women have been relegated to voting only and less participation. I'm, I'm, I find this, I'm, I'm a bit surprised actually that you, 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 this is still the reality as it were, because there's a lot of talk about the increasing number of women participation um, in the electoral process. You still have, uh, to some degree, women coming up. So how are those women you know, surpassing these challenges that you talked about, having meetings at night, uh, you know, the challenges of fundraising and the violence that come with election. Remember we talked about the integrity of elections. If we can address that, then maybe the violent part will be out and then women can have, uh, you know, better uh, participation. If we look at it on a graph, those women who rise up are outliers. They're very few. Look at the recently held um, um, elections for the African National Congress here. How many women are in that executive? And how many men are at the top bodies of the, body, of, 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 of the executive? The top three positions are occupied by men. The chairman, the president, the vice president, they're all occupied by men. So how can, women we, how can we change not, that? And this is, a party, this is a party that has been in existence for 110 years. 
So how can we change that? I mean, this is 2022. Women are part, in fact, the population of women, some say we're out, it's more than that of their male counterpart. And we have young people, 18 to uh, 30, that are coming up on a daily basis, educated young women. How can we begin to um, improve women participation in, in politics and in the voting process? Because it is a task that we have to achieve. The lack of women in position is not because they are not interested. It's simply a factor that the environment is not conducive for them to participate, like I mentioned. So, but how can we change it? How can we change it? How can we change the environment? Because the whole idea of having this conversation is to see how we can get more people engaged in the electoral process, go out and vote and have a voice. The first thing is women themselves they should stop pulling down their own who rise up the leadership positions. Women are in their large numbers. Help me understand why we can't have more candidates coming through. If they need to be able to deal with all these deterrents, all these factors that are limiting. Organize better, push better, vote for your own. What about the young people? Okay, I thought you continue, people, continue. I thought uh, you'd finish your thought. People, the, yeah. the, 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 the very disappointing factor is that young people, if you look at data, the level of participation, the young women, even young people, is very low. They are disillusioned. And that's one critical element that we need to understand is that how, how are we communicating with them to participate? And that's why and we're having this conversation with you, sir. I'm, I'm, we're, we're looking at solutions, how we can, you know, begin to, no matter how small, say little drops of water eventually it goes to become an ocean. I don't know so, how so, true so, so, that so, is. So, so I, argue with, I always argue with my team mm -hmm. that the methods in which we are using to campaign, they are not appealing to young people. So in essence, if young people are interested in modern music, rap music, um, they are spending more time in spaces that entertain them, use the language of those spaces to get them to vote. That's why I'm a strong advocate of saying, campaign on TikTok. If you go on Twitter, if you go on Facebook, you don't get them. And when you go on TikTok, campaign using their language. Make sure that they hear you and they understand you. Have a conversation with them to say, how do you want us to unpack issues that are meaningful to you? We are speaking a language that we are accustomed to when we are campaigning, but that is not making sense to young people who would like to vote. Fair enough. So technology is enhancing the process. It's something we should pursue. Um, has it all been good? Or is there um, ways we can better use technology? Uh, you've talked about TikTok, but it goes beyond that in the digital space, doesn't it? It, does, it goes beyond that. And I think this is why I said earlier on that when you find a young person the first thing about an election is understanding what their aspirations are. What do they want to get out in life? There is a reality that we need to accept, that the connection between how a voter will benefit a young person and what it means to them, there's a, there's a greater disconnect. And so just announcing that there's an election and say we're going to encourage them to go out and vote is not enough. We need to be able, in some instances, maybe we might need to think through or say, maybe, you see, democracy is a taught value. Participation is a taught value. I always argue to say, we start electing people when our young people are 18. Maybe introduce participative democracy in the education system. They don't have to have prefects being appointed. Let them elect prefects. Let them understand the whole idea of having representatives within their schools and how they are also removed through means of democratic process. Then they will appreciate it. I, I frankly buy into the idea of uh, participatory democracy in schools, but how do you think that would work? 
you know, across board? Is it something, uh, at some point, civic, edu uh, civic uh, education, I think, was in schools and it was removed um, in some countries. Um, do you think that this is something that um, African leaders will consider as a way of um, increasing voter engagement? It's very important to include it because when you, when you don't give it the importance that it deserves, these values, they come on board later in someone's life. So it's very difficult now to help them understand how they connect with this. So it's very important not only to teach participation, but to teach them how to understand how it affects their public life, how the politics is important, and why they have to be an active and responsible citizen. These values, if they are taught at a younger age, it helps them to realize that it is in their best interest to participate. So now they look at voting as it's for adults, it's not for us, they will decide for us. How then do you want them automatically when they're 18 to embrace these values? Uh, when you say adults, it, it takes me back to the concern that's expressed every time about the, the age of those that are coming out to contest for office. It looks like we keep recycling the same uh, crop of people over and over again, not just in one African country, but across board. And this, to some degree, people argue, is causing fatigue among the young people. Where would you come into that conversation, for instance, to uh, try and get more young people to bring themselves out to participate in for elective posts as one way to also increase the engagement of um, the youth? The reality of it is that let's look at how many young people are holding positions in political parties. How many of them are leading in political parties? We cannot expect to have candidates running for council, running for member of parliament, when they are not actively within those institutions that bring out the leadership. It doesn't work. So the first part of call is helping political parties inject young people within their ranks. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Uh, I, I saw it and I knew how important that is in this discourse because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, the decisions affect us. Um, but these young people that, I mean, we have to take part in um, party politics. If you look at it as well, the P, there is this sit tight syndrome. And then the people that are there look for obstacles um, to keep the young people away, what would you advise? How do you think they can begin to navigate to find their uh, space in the political parties in order for them to even bring themselves out for elective positions? Because it doesn't look like that's happening now. Political parties are a vehicle for people to be able to get power. They're business. And there is no way those who are older will be able to seed power. The reality is once we have educated the young people in understanding the importance of political parties, either they join and ensure that they disrupt and include and involve themselves within the structure, or they form their own political parties to disrupt the process. There is no way. Look at all the political parties on the continent. When they're telling you about people who are in the youth league, they are 45, 50 and above. These are the people who are saying they're in charge. Look at the age group of candidates, 75, 80, very old, tired people who, in essence, have really achieved a lot, but they still want to govern. So the reality is young people have to use their energy, their education to disrupt the process. This is why I argued earlier on that if we don't join political parties, if we don't get young people who are efficient within political parties, it's very difficult to change the political system. That is very valid. Let's go back to the um, use of technology and the digital space to enhance um, engagement. Um, on the flip side of that conversation, we know that um, the web hasn't penetrated all parts of the continent. So there are still people in rural communities who don't have the kind of access that elites in the cities and those that have, you know, in semi-cities have. So how can we improve access to um, the kind of information that will 
enhance engagement, voter engagement in rural communities? You need to understand the following, that politicians thrive on an uninformed voter. So the reason why a lot of infrastructure on the continent is not being uh, advanced or being built is that a politician is scared of an informed voter. And therefore, this mobile divide or lack of penetration for citizens to get information, there is a group of people that is benefiting from it. That is why campaigning should go beyond what is currently available in the metros, in the urban centers. There is need to think through to say, people are going to go to the deep tank with their cows. Let me go there and be part and parcel of this. People are going to go to the field and till their land. How do I communicate with them and help them to make an informed choice? Without that, without disruptive, active players in politics, politicians who are used to the game, they are so much happy to remain with an uninformed world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know how we're going to... So, who's, civil society organizations are part of the people that educate uh, voters. We also have political parties doing that. Are they doing enough, or is there more that you think they can do to um, get this information out? I always argue that we call for change in political parties and politicians, but we never call for change in civil society. Civil society that we currently have, like I said earlier on, they've got old, tired skills. In fact, my argument is that they don't have, remember, the nature of civil society that we have are people who are passionate, people who love activism. They've got a role to play, but they lack the tool set to be able to deal with that folding political environment. And in reality, what can they do? They will hold, go out and vote campaigns, they will hold press statements, they will go to court. What else do they have to do? <laughs> the environment remains the same. There are two boxes limited. They need also to evolve and change and be able to adapt to this, because politicians are getting more and more sophisticated. They are remaining stuck. So let's go back to the um, comment you made earlier about educating um, the people, the, the electorate, the who, who are they voting for, why are they voting, and how uh, they're going to do that. A lot of this also has something to do with the work that the media does. So nowadays, media has gone to we've gone digital. Everybody is on their mobile devices. Again, we talk about those in the rural community that don't have access um, to uh, these uh, digital devices. So where is the role of the media? Are they playing it well? And in what areas do you think they can do better? We need to dissuade ourselves from thinking that the media is independent. Media always has a position that it takes. And um, in as much as we would encourage our people to be able to, to get access and information from the media, they also need to understand that media is not independent. They always have a role. They all, are always attached to either of the side. But the most important thing is I'm very, very excited that we are having a conversation of interrogating how a voter is supposed to vote and what influences. If we could have more of these discussions, they would be useful. The challenge is most media is interested in the theatrics of what happens within political parties. I was, I was arguing with a friend a couple of years ago. I said, media, which is covering developments in political parties, they will cover who has done what, what is the scandal of them, without understanding the intricacies of intra-party politics. What is complex about the political party? What needs to change? How do we influence it? This conversation that you are having is you moving aside from discussing party A and party B and looking at the concept, the science, the principles around it, how we need to change. Unfortunately, our media is not used to that. They want to sell drama. And unfortunately, people are not being educated. Uh, that really needs to change. And I do agree uh, with you to a large extent. Um, we are failing in certain aspects. And for, in Nigeria, for instance, the politics is um, um, 
alight with scandals after scandals from each political party, their candidate, whether they have a certificate or they have fraud, and they're not talking about what they're going to do. I think um, we have a role to play indeed as well. There's something I want you to speak on uh, quickly. I, I, I need you to amplify it because it resonates with me. Uh, you said that politicians thrive on uninformed voters and that politicians are scared of informed voters. How can we amplify this message in such a way that voters understand the power that they have to change the narrative? I, I think one of the things that we need to be able to understand is that because, vote, because politicians know that an uninformed voter benefits them, they minimize the information that they dish out. And this is where I like your point on what can media do? What can a reformed civil society do? Is they need to take the conversation differently to be able to break it down to say, your vote matters if you use it responsibly. Look at how we have lived the last five years. The same candidate is coming, promising you the same. These are your options. And also encouraging. One of the things that shocks me, and I always argue, is that there's very few resources, if any, that are being deployed towards capacity building of political parties, building them. And yet they play the most critical role in the governance of a country. If you talk to most funders, they'll say, they are risky, we don't want to be partisan. But let me tell you this. The political party with most of these uneducated people, the most corrupt, are going to be determining the fate of your economy and policies. How then is that not critical to support? How then is it not critical to ensure that quality candidates come in? I don't understand it. A lot needs to be done if we're to get it right, uh, indeed. Thank you very much, Glenn Mpani, for speaking with us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a very good evening and thank you to your listeners. You too. You too. Thank you. We can't say it enough. As flawed as democracy is in Africa, indeed around the world, it remains our best option for growth as a people. And voter participation is an important way for citizens to guide the political process. Let's not forget for a second that our individual action or inaction has consequences for our democracy. Glenn and many others before him have emphasized and continue to do so that you and I have the power to decide on the quality of life we want for ourselves and our communities and even for future generations. Voting is our chance to stand up for issues we care about. Voting, rather than just venting on social media or protesting, is the best way to make our voices heard. So, go on, please, participate. Vote wisely and stay active. Thanks for being with us on the program today. I'll see you next time. Bye.